Okay, so if you don't know who I am, I'm John Hessling. Um, I work for the Muskegon Police Department. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, this active killer training we've been putting on for a lot of different schools and businesses around town. Uh, so if you work somewhere you think that this would be beneficial after I'm done, let me know. Uh, we'll get set up and uh, get this pushed out to wherever you work at or whatever, whatever you're involved in. So, uh, this is the, one of those things that nobody really wants to talk about. He wants to think about this thing happening, um, and I think Jim kind of spoke to uh, my point here is when something drastic like that happens, you don't know what you'll do. Uh, so thinking about it is step one. There's a lot of things with this you can't train to do um, as an average citizen. You kind of rely on people like me to come in and save the day. Not really. This isn't, this isn't superhero training. So, um, But just thinking about it. Beginning step here. So, when we're talking about preparing for the day that we hope never comes, uh, I pared some of this down. There's a there's a video that we normally show as part of a, it's an excerpt from a Canadian crime TV show, uh, and it begins with uh, the school shooting that's going on. It's one of the most realistic things we've ever been able to get a hold of to use for training to show people what really happens when this this goes on. Uh, there's a lot of violence and gore and some language in it, so I decided, well, we're not going to play that today, but it, it, it shows a lot of people hiding under tables and and, and the, the fact that the, these people that come in and do these types of things, they're not there to, to negotiate. They don't, they don't want anything other than what they're already doing. Um, so that's missing, so I apologize for that. Uh, start with a little bit of history. So everybody remembers Columbine in high school, right? It was huge in the news back in 99. So 13 people were killed, 21 people were wounded, and three were injured while escaping the killing zone. This changed um, how law enforcement responded to these events. Now, there was a lot of misinformation. Uh, for whatever reason, when some big stuff like this happens, huge agencies come in and there's uh, a gag order. So people that are involved in this stuff aren't allowed to talk about it. Real information isn't put out there. Misinformation gets put out there, okay? So 99% of anything you've ever heard about Columbine is not true, okay? Specifically, the thing that, that I'm passionate about is there were officers that were there, immediately went in, and did what they could with the training they had at the time. They weren't, we didn't have guys standing outside letting this terrible thing happen on the inside. All the video stuff that you probably saw was, it was all reenactments. There was one video in the building, it's very grainy and very terrible. Uh, so if that's not the video you saw, and you saw some nice dramatized thing with clear, clear footage, that's fake. So um, while a lot of bad things did happen in Columbine, there was a lot of good done, but there was a lot that we learned from as well. Uh, active killer events. So the U.S. Secret Service reports that no accurate profile exists for the type of people that come and do these active killer events, okay? We've all seen those movies where the detective comes in and they can they can tell you that it's a 30 year old white male whose mom never loved him. You know, no profile exists for the people that do this kind of type of thing. They're they're there to cause mass casualties, get them high publicity, because the news perpetually is what it's creating, uh, and they want the ability to control everything until the very end. They're looking for that enormous impact on the community. So historically speaking, ineffective and incomplete safety protocols lead to repeated disastrous outcomes. So what have we done since, since these things started happening? We shove it in the corner. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to train for it. We don't want to change anything to prevent it from happening. That's why this stuff continues to happen. I've not updated this since 2010. Uh, I did a little bit of research in most the percentages all stay the same. While the events keep growing, the percentages are staying the same. So 49% of these things are happening in the workplace, 29 are happening in the school. And you wouldn't think that those, you would think those two are flip-flop because that's all we hear about is school, 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 school. We love our children. It's absolutely terrible that this stuff happens to them. But the majority of this stuff, according to their the, the FBI and uh, Secret Service's definition, happens in the workplace. And then 49% are other. And those are like open air and open air. 29% uh, happen in other places that are open-air environments, like the uh, 
pastored a couple years ago in Vegas. Yep. Uh, churches would kind of fall into this. Other other areas. Nightclub. Yep. Yep. So on the bottom of here, uh, I forgot to bring my little packet with me, but I've got a, a list from 2001 to 2016. The FBI compiled all of these these events that fit their definition, and it's broke down to different areas, schools, businesses, government buildings, houses of worship, uh, there's another category. Uh, I usually like to go through whatever area I'm speaking to and read those out. There's six or seven. Um, most of them we've never even heard about. So these things are happening. They do happen in churches, uh, other places like that. So it's a very real risk. While we, we feel like you know, this probably isn't going to happen, it is a real risk. Born history, Virginia Tech, 2007, 22-year-old Marine student. Uh, he kills 35, wounds 20, 32, wounds 25. He had multiple weapons and chain links to the doors. He can just walk all down the hallway, room to room, that he can get into, shooting and killing people. Uh, you know, we always talk about thinking outside of the box. The point I like to make here is, you know, he chained the entrance door so the cops show up. We can't get in. The doors are locked, right? There was a witness that came out after the fact that said that they saw a female student show up late to school after these doors were chained, and she couldn't get in. And they saw her go next door and pull up a window, push up a window, and find her because she was late to school. But a bunch of cops couldn't figure out how to, how to, how to get into the building. So when it comes to these things, we've got to we got to think about them a little bit differently. Just a little diagram of what happened there. So he comes in, he kills the one in the hallway, and you can see as, as these rooms go on that, that there's less casualties, there's less injuries. And you might think that, well, that's just because it starts here and people become aware of it, which is true, but it kind of speaks to the point that as you kind of go through, you know, those first two rooms, pretty devastating. Uh, two of four, there's 19 people in there, two of them were, only two of them were killed. Two of seven, there were five killed and 13 were present. So he comes in, does some shooting, goes back out, tries to come back in, and they barricade the door. Two of five, 12 kids present, zero kills, zero wounded, because they barricaded the door. So if you've got something in place where that door is barricaded, you know, from the get go, and bad guy can't get in, now we're starting to do our job. So, active shooters are there to kill, okay? They've got no intention of negotiating. They're there to see mass casualties. If they're determined to get in the building, they will. You know, there are things that could be done here to help harden this, but the fact is, I mean, we've got a huge glass front. Does anybody want to change that? No. Do we have to change that? No. But no matter what else we do, if somebody is motivated enough, they're going to get in. Um, when, they come, when somebody comes into a, a building with a gun, they are there to kill. There's no put the gun down. There's no how you doing, what's wrong. Like they're there to kill, and that's when it's time to act. Uh, and true first responders are people that are there at the event. You know, people think the firefighters are first responders, the police are first responders, but the people that first respond to the event are, are the first responders. So to think through this, what you're going to do and how you're going to react, and not waiting for somebody else to, to do it for you is the is the goal. Because the police aren't going to respond until they're is there something we can do better? Uh, passiveness can be deadly in this. So we have to have we have to kind of change our mindset. A lot of times we think, well, you know, if something happens, this is what I'm going to do. You know, you need to think when something happens. When this happens, what are you going to do? Okay. So proactive leadership means preparing for the worst case scenario. We've got to educate people. We have to harden targets, limit access. We've got to do something to disrupt this this person's action. Because mental preparedness equals enhanced survivability. There was uh, Colonel John Boyd was a fighter pilot uh, several years ago. He came up with this, this uh, acronym called CUDA loop. And it stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. So everything you do, you observe it, you orientate yourself to it, you decide that you're going to do it, and then you act. Well, his, his training was how do we get, how do we disrupt that CUDA loop? For bad fighter, bad guy fighter pilots, but you can apply that to anything, and that's 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 a lot of what we'll talk about a little bit later.
later is doing something to disrupt this person's actions, make them continue to orient themselves or observe something so they're not deciding and acting. Most of these people, when they come in, they've already, they've already oriented themselves to this building, and they're here, they've decided, and now they're here acting. And anything we can do to, to break up that cycle is going to help us survive. Uh, anonymous quote experience is something you, you get right after you need it. Uh, one of the things that we talk about in, in our training with the team is you don't want the first time you do something to be the first time you do something. Now, we're not going to be able to do something here for the first time that she says, but the first time you think about this, I don't want it to be the first time you thought about it. So the Department of Homeland Security came up with this program. It's really simple. Uh, I like it. It's called Run, Fight, Fight. So run, get out of the, the scenario if you can. If you can't, hide. Find somewhere to hide. That's, that's a, a safe place to be. And the last resort, fight back. Again, this isn't superhero training. I'm not telling everybody to, to go out and learn Kung Fu and come in here and, 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 and save everybody. But everybody has the capability to do some kind of fighting if the scenario calls for it. So again, just thinking about it will help. Again, not mandating that you must do this, but providing some options to choose from in the greatest moment of need. <coughs> you have to make the decision what is the best for you at the time. But if, you don't, if you haven't thought about it, you're not going to make the best decision Hopefully, thinking about this will empower you to save your own life and the life of others. Uh, so, when, 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 when this thing happens, we've got to have good information. So, you've got to pay attention to what's going on. Uh, again, if somebody walks in with a gun, like they're really walking in with a gun. Um, you need to be able to inform everybody of the specific reason and location of the threat. Here, maybe it's yelling down the hallway. You know, maybe it's the security person yelling at the check in desk and running into the sanctuary. And, telling everybody else. Uh, maybe it's something else. And if anybody has an idea, you know, we can bring them together at a later time and, and try to figure out what, what is best. But um, if you've got a PA, an intercom, cell phone, uh, making sure you're dialing 911. Uh, but you've got, to, you've got to get that information to get it out quick out to the patients. When we talk about running, Studies show that, that bosses, people in leadership, you have to authorize people to run. You have to tell people it's okay to get out. It's okay if you're in your classroom and you bust the window and tell everybody to jump out the window and you go somewhere that you think is safe. Okay? Don't sit in a room because, well, nobody told me I could bust that window to get out. Do what is best for you at the time. Okay? Getting out the building running reduces the number of victims in the crisis zone. You know, if we have a predetermined off, off area rally point, whether it's the school or this back corner or uh, the, the other church just across the yard here, we'll, we'll identify somewhere that, that that point is to be. We see it all over town at, at Paul Street and Han and down in Monsanto. And all these large industrial places have got that figured out. Uh, and it, it's not just for fire drills and tornado drills and things like that. They're incorporating that stuff into this type of training as well. Um, we don't want anybody getting in a vehicle. So if you go out and you get in your car and you take off, you might have a vital piece of information that somebody needs later. The other thing is, is as fire trucks and cop cars are trying to get in here, and we got 60 cars trying to get out in a panic, and now we've got a bunch of traffic accidents and, and an entryway to the, to the church and we can't get anybody in here. Get in your vehicle, just sit in your vehicle, you stay in your vehicle, you think that's the safe place that you need to be, but don't get in your vehicle and drive off. Hiding is an excellent starting point. If you can't run and get out, you need to find a good safe place to hide. And last, a complete standalone fence. You know, if I just jump over that counter and hide in the kitchen, that's probably not a really great place to hide. We want somewhere safe, a solid door or something to lock. Thing. Um, this is a this is a, a program that we got from somewhere else as a part of a specific program. And this hasn't been changed, but it's a point to talk about. So they say no one enters a room after lockdown is initiated. So we kind of talked about it a little bit. Lori brought it up as if somebody comes down the hallway and they want their kid and they want to leave. 
sorry, ma'am, lockdown is initiated. We can't let you in that room. So if you're the teacher in that room, there's somebody out there pounding on the door. I want my kid. You have to make the decision. Am I going to open? Am I going to open that door? Am I going to let that parent in to get their kid back? When I think that there's something really bad happening, but the decision you have to make is you got to think about if I let that door in, you know, extreme case, bad guy is out there, and maybe it's a domestic situation where mom is there at the door trying to get their kid, and dad is our gunman. Dad has a gun to mom's head saying, you go down there and get our kids out of here because, you know, X, Y, Z. I'm not going to get too graphic. But, and you open that door. Now you've just let mom in, but you've let, you know, just right. dad gunman in as well. So it, you've got to use your best judgment. Nobody's going to con condemn you, you know, or whatever happens. But you just have to think about those things. It's, you've got to think about what am I going to do because uh, if you don't think about it, We've got to look at, we have to look at enhancements, fortifying and securing rooms, keeping the doors locked, how can we barricade and harden this target? So as you go back and you're in these rooms teaching kids or doing nursery or whatever, look around. If something happens, is that a solid door? Is it locked from the inside? Is there something I can put in front of it that's going to keep anybody from opening it? Um, just, just little things so when it happens, you know what you're going to do. And when we're fighting, the goal is to enhance survivability, right? Nobody's gonna, nobody just, most of us don't just go out and get in fights for fun, okay? I would say nobody in this room goes out and gets, gets in fights for fun. Some people do, uh, most people don't. There are lots of things you can go out and you can learn, you can teach yourself, those are those are kind of on you, but some of that stuff is you gonna learn, uh, it could enhance your survivability, it could help you take care of somebody else. Somebody comes in here with a gun in your clothes, and you've made that decision. You've, you've observed, you've orientated yourself, and you've made that decision as you act. The idea is to secure that weapon. You hit the guy in the head, and he falls down, and you just stand there and watch him, and he reaches over and picks the gun back up. That's not, that's not the goal. You kick the thing. Uh, one of the things we tell people is take the gun and throw it in the trash can. Who looks in a trash can for a gun? Not the bad guy that you just knocked unconscious on the floor when he comes in. And you're not standing there holding it when the police show up looking for a gunman, right? Nobody wants that either. So stick in the trash can. It's just a really simple, easy place to remember. And everybody we've talked to uh, seems, seems pretty agreeable with that. So uh, the other thing is, is hopefully this just it, this can help empower you to save uh, your life or somebody else's, okay? Because you are the first responder. Again, the police, we're coming, but we're not there yet. You guys are. Make sure that you make that decision and you're going to do it and be aggressive. Simple ways to make yourself a difficult target. Everybody that's ever shot knows that it's hard enough to shoot a standing piece of paper or whatever, pop can, whatever it is. But if that pop can were swinging or whatever you're shooting at is moving, it's harder to hit. So move, don't stand still. It makes a noise, cause distractions, create distance. The school has gone through some Alice training. Um, and one of the parts of Alice training is they teach you to throw whatever you've got on your desk, throw books, throw, throw whatever. Um, and, and thinking through that, going through some of that kind of training works. A couple years ago, we did a big scenario at the Mustang High School, and a bunch of teachers were involved. And as we were going through this scenario, we came into the library. And as we come in, all of a sudden, somebody starts throwing books at us. Like, that's really odd. It, it kind of put us off guard. You know, the bad guy's not going to be throwing books at us. They've got the, the sim guns that shoot paint rounds at us. And they hurt. These are books. They don't throw books at me. Mm -hmm. It was a teacher. And this, this, this scenario just got so real for her. She saw somebody come into the library with a gun and just started chucking books. <clears throat> and talked to her after the fact. Like she, she, it, it was real for her. And she saw a gun and she started chucking books. So this creating noise, distractions, throwing people things at this, this individual, it works. Uh, creating distance. If you're gonna, if we're gonna fight, and we're gonna, we want to swarm with numbers. You know, if, uh, if two people fight, it's kind of a 50-50, but we want to, we want to change those odds. So we need, we need to get a lot of people with us. Uh, everybody's aware. Back in 2017, there was a school or a church shooting down in Texas. I read a new 
news article preparing for this, uh, and it says, Texas shooting shows why a good guy with a gun isn't enough. So, a uh, Southern Texas news report that an armed neighbor saved lives when he intervened with a weapon. However, he had already killed at least 26 people, uh, wounding 20 others. So, the point of this is, this, this guy, and, and he, he did a great thing. I'm not trying to take any credit from him at all. But I think that the news slanted what he did a little bit. He had already gone into the church. He had already killed 26 people and wounded 20 others. This guy intervened outside of the church, shooting this guy and chasing him down the highway. Okay? We want to focus on what are we going to do in here. If some of those people would have had some training like this, maybe things would have been different. I don't know. But I don't want anybody to, to, to think that what happened down in Texas was a success necessarily. I mean, the guy did a great thing in their meeting outside. I wish more people would, would, would take on that path. But what he did was outside. And we're talking about what happened inside. So even if you have a gun, lack of training and practice makes you ineffective. More guns are not always the answer. Uh, we're going to talk about guns here in the church in just a minute. So in 2008, Kirkwood, Missouri City Council, uh, a gunman shot and killed this armed cop outside, killed another and wounded two civilians inside. And his attorney, John Hessel, wrote, prevented further victims and facilitated his own escape and others by throwing chairs at this gunman while being shot at and wounded. So even while being shot, this guy started throwing chairs at this bad guy, got everybody else out. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. What are we going to do inside? <clears throat> so in Antioch, Tennessee, in 2017, just a couple months before what happened in Sutherland Springs, a suspect uh, that came in and shot at that church, he did not expect an usher to have come to struggle with him to try to stop the shooting inside of the Metro National Police Department. National Police Department. The only casualty during this event was outside. Seven people were wounded inside. So in Antioch, this guy's in the parking lot, he's got some guns. He wants to go in and do some bad stuff. He shoots somebody outside of the church. So he goes inside the church, and immediately this usher tackles the guy, wrestles him to the ground. He's getting pissed away by this guy's handgun all the while, and eventually gets the gun away from him and saves the day. Those are the kind of things that we're talking about. Again, this isn't superhero training, but that guy had thought about it. He knew what he was going to do when that guy came in. He'd been through some training, he'd figured a couple things out, but most importantly, he had thought about it. He knew what he was going to do when that happened. So if you have a gun, practice, practice, practice. If you don't practice, it's not going to be any good. Uh, one of the things that the uh, firearm instructor academy used to always tell us is that we won't rise to the level, we won't rise to the occasion. We're going to sink to our level of training. So you're only going to do as well as you're trained to do in any scenario like that. Uh, so our church's location is unique. There's an Iowa Code section there for anybody that likes numbers. This is a weapons-free zone. 1,000 feet from Mulberry School is considered a weapons-free zone. So we're kind of unique. There's a lot of churches around town that don't have to worry about this. They can carry guns and the church can endorse it, whatever. Uh, so there is an exception to a weapons-free zone, which anybody that carries a gun here in church would have to obtain. So a person who has been specifically authorized by the school to go armed with, carry, or transport a firearm on school grounds, including for the purposes of conducting instructional training or program regarding firearms. So if you carry a gun with you and you just leave it in your truck or your car out here in the parking lot, that's technically in violation of the school rules. If you carry it in here, that's a violation. Uh, that's the reason why Without the school's permission, we would never hold a, a firearms training program here at the church because we would have to get their specific permission to do so. So what does that mean? That means you have to write a letter to the superintendent of the school district and say, I'm so-and-so, I'm going to carry a gun uh, on my person while I'm at church at First Baptist. I realize we work within 1,000 feet, and the law says I need your permission. Sincerely signed, whoever. I do have a format that I use had some discussions with them, um, but every individual needs to do that if you decide to, uh, to carry a, a gun here on the church property. So. Again, the 
DHS has best recommendations to get out as accurate as you can hide, but you have to take out if you must. Um, there's a high probability that law enforcement will not be present when uh, active folks start shooting, and this provides you a means of safe to, to live and survive. So back to Columbine a little bit. 700 kids at Columbine fled without anybody having to tell them to do so, because it's natural. Why I like this program because it's simple, it's natural, it's things that, that you should do uh, if you think about it. So that was over half the school. Um, it's instinctive, and nobody ever had to tell them to do that. And I would imagine that if you think about this a little bit, nobody's got to tell half these kids to do it. Now, there are some people that, that will. There's some people who will talk about it, think about it. Fear is the unknown and it's a natural shock and response. We've all heard of fight, flight, and freeze. Fear can be conquered with preparation. So again, we're not holding some, some active shooter training here where everybody's gonna get shot or shoot people with paint guns and stuff. Um, but you've got to prepare, even if it's just that little bit mentally. Your mind, uh, somebody said something like this before too, your mind is like a Rolodex, okay? If you never experience something, you just, that Rolodex is just spinning and it's looking for some kind of a familiar scenario to apply it to. But if you've thought about it and you kind of mentally prepared yourself, Get there a lot quicker, and you can you can provide a lot a quicker response. Uh, fun fact: I don't like public speaking, uh, but I prepare for it. I've given this this presentation probably close to a dozen times now in a bunch of uh, different audiences. Uh, even today, it's kind of weird because I I, I know everybody here, and it's kind of awkward. But I'm passionate about it, and I prepared for it, and so I conquered that fear. Physically, most people have the necessary skills, but they haven't prepared themselves mentally. They don't, you, you haven't completed your toolkit. You're still observing, 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 but you've got to observe, and you've got, now you've got to start orienting. So when you go back to our classrooms and wherever at the church, orientate yourself in some of this stuff. Make that decision. If this happens, I'm going to do this. And then when the day comes, you're going to act. Advantages of this program, escape is always an option. Uh, but there's ways to interrupt the active folks are assuming the cycle increases confidence and reduces fear. So when you mentally prepare, if you're going to fight, you want to utilize the storm technique to get control. And you got to remember, this isn't a movie where the guy comes in and he wants pizza and a helicopter. This guy is here to do some bad things. He's not going to negotiate. If they if they if they if, if they if they're negotiating if they're, you're talking to them, they're buying the time so they can continue to do what they're doing. They're not they're not trying to actually get whatever you're trying to negotiate. So you've got to remember that. You've got to recognize threat. You have to rapidly assess it. Again, perception of reality. When somebody comes in and you, you see a gun or something bad happening, like that's a gun. That's something bad happening. You've got to you've got to act. Any action is better than no action. Response can be anything, it just can't be passive. Most gunshots are not fatal. We've got an individual in town uh, that I personally know that has been shot, physically shot. Uh, he's been stabbed, he's been shot at, and he's still walking around alive uh, and well, unfortunately. So 80% of gunshot wounds are survivable. Uh, law enforcement, again, since all these incidents have happened, we've change how we respond to things. Uh, we're getting first aid in here a lot quicker. Uh, so many of the fatalities are due to bleeding out, so we're mitigating that problem. We've got to control the bleeding, so be the first aid kit, put pressure on things, stuff like that. Uh, law enforcement will respond immediately. It's going to take a little bit of time to get here once 911 has been called. Um, when something like this happens, our primary goal is to locate, contain, and stop the killer. So we're going to be asking questions we're moving on. And as we move on, now we've created a space behind us for somebody to bring uh, EMTs in and start treating people, or somebody else to grab you and drag you outside so EMTs can, can treat you. So those first couple of officers are going to come in and gonna ask the questions, and they're going to move on. Don't grab onto them. I know this is a dire scenario, and you want some help, but there are other people that need help as well. And if we can get in and contain and stop the killer, that's, that's, that's goal number one. Keep your hands visible. If you're laying on the ground and you're, you can hear us and we 
saying show us your hands and you hide your hands under your body. You better be telling us why you're hiding your hands under your body because otherwise we think that you're somebody trying to hide something. So keep your hands visible if you can. If you can't, that's when you want to uh, cut off this video and end it because we're going to save another 10 minutes. So uh, that is that. Does anybody have any brief questions so we don't drag this thing out too far? If anybody has some in-depth questions, I'll give you the afterward and you can email me or call me and then pull me aside at some other time. Yep. 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 Hit him. Hit him with a fire extinguisher. Spray the fire extinguisher at him. I don't know if you've ever had a fire extinguisher sprayed at you, but it's nasty. Uh, it takes your breath away. So uh, that's a that's a good tool. Yes. Yep. That's, that stays here longer. That is probably safety glass only, and I would almost guarantee it's not bullet resistant. The nice thing is, is we have that, we have small lights on those. Uh, so and I assume you're talking about the internal doors. Yeah. Well, the, the ones in the classroom. Yes. Yep. They're they got small lights on those doors. So yeah, I mean, for somebody to bust it out and reach in and, and, and open the door, probably not going to happen. Most of these people, what happens is, is they're cruising down the hallway. Oh, that door's locked. I'm moving on. They don't want resistance. That's why the majority of these people can end their own life because they're not there to encounter resistance. They want the easy work, and then when it gets hard, it's like they're done. That's where uh, you know you gotta you gotta evaluate that. Look around. If I can't get out the window, where am I gonna hide? Where am I gonna hunker down in the room that I can't see me through the through the light? You know, and, and you know I've got I've got some safety. Uh, yeah, every every case is, is different. I've been to lots of different places, and there's there's. there's yeah. different. Maybe we just take a we, we take the crank in. And we've got one for every room, but I assume we still have them somewhere. And that, that's your job as a yeah, that's your job job as a teacher is to know where the crank is at to close the window if you need to. You know, they said there this is this is meant to be thought provoking, yeah, not just all inclusive. <laughs> So, like I said, if anybody has any follow-up questions, I'm available whenever. Um, if you work somewhere, you think something like this would be beneficial, let me know, and we'll get that pushed out there as well. Thanks, John. Thanks, John.